I guess we've been working together for a while. Yesterday, I thought about calling Robin to change music today because I hadn't yet looked at the whole order. And I was going to ask you, could we sing I Choose Love? Um, the title of the sermon is We Love One Another, but it could just as easily be uh, I Choose Love. Uh, we're in the midst of an ongoing two-series Easter season. And for the first three weeks of this Easter season, we asked, how shall we live? And then we moved into the second three-week series that we're now in, how shall we love? And in the last two weeks, in asking the question, how shall we live? We said we abide or we remain with Christ. Um, and then when asking the question, how shall we love? We said we bear fruit. Um, which last week I cast primarily in terms of service to other people, uh, which is biblical. Today, in answering the question, how shall we love? The simple answer is, we love one another. And if that all sounds a little redundant, well, consider the source. John chapter 15, beginning in the ninth verse. As the Father loved me, I too have loved you. Remain or abide, different translation, remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you'll remain or abide in my love. Just as I kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I've said these things to you so that my joy will be in you and your joy will be complete. This is my commandment. Love one another just as I've loved you. No one has greater love than to give up one's life for one's friends. You're my friends. If you do what I command you. I don't call you servants any longer because servants don't know what their master is doing. Instead, I call you friends because everything I heard from my father I've made known to you. You didn't choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you so that you could go and produce fruit, and so that your fruit could last. As a result, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. I give you these commandments so that you can love each other. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. God, we do thank you for your endless and ever surprising love. You love us and you love others even when we don't. Enable us, O oh Lord, to grow in our love that we would give even our lives for a friend. Because you did. Amen. Uh, it feels like a year already. Um, there's an intractable war halfway around the world in which we're involved. There are protests going on college campuses across the country where law enforcement officers are forced to come in and try to re, re, uh, regain order. Um, violence is raging in Israel. Um, Black Lives Matter, but not to all. And even O.J. Simpson makes the news. And in the midst of that, um, a very thoughtful poet named John writes some poetry entitled, All You Need Is Love. I'm talking, of course, about 1967. And I'm talking about the poet John Lennon, who along with Paul McCartney wrote these lyrics for a never-before event in the world entitled One World. It would be the largest viewed event ever on television at that time, beamed to 25 countries and somewhere, they estimate, between 400 and 700 million people to bring a message of love in a racked time of our country and our world's history. John Lennon, who was 
a little further down the road perhaps than his bandmates in really incarnating the spirit of peace and love about which he wrote, believed that it was a song necessary for the times. He said when others were showing on television knitting in Canada and Irish clog dancing in Venezuela, I simply thought this was a word that needed to be said in this time. Beatles biographer, official biographer, Hunter Davies, talked to uh, George Harrison, who put it more simply. Uh, he said, this was a song that we simply needed to sing, and it could be taken two ways. One, either that love is everything that we need and have in front of us, within us, or it can be viewed alternatively, love is what we don't have yet. Love is what we just haven't got yet. And that for Harrison, he said, and besides all this, we thought it was a good PR bit for God. John, the poet of this gospel and of the letters of John, would agree that not only is love the only thing you need, it is everything for everything, for everyone, for all the time, no exceptions. And he writes this uh, with, uh, of course, Jesus' words, but he writes this with this litmus test. Are we loving one another, meaning all persons, are we loving one another as we would our friends? Think about that. Because it would seem that no, much, no matter how much we talk about loving, teach about loving, repeat about loving, preach about loving, we just don't do it very well. Case in point, 63% of the American population claims Jesus Christ as their Lord. You would think we'd be a little better at it than we are as a country. In the national poll taken not long after All You Need Is Love was released in 1967, the question was, who in human history is the most influential person of all time? Jesus Christ came in third place. And when the respondents were asked, third place? How? Why? The response was uniform. There is every reason by what he did and for whom he did it and how he lived his life and what he taught that Jesus should be the most influential person in the world. The problem is his followers have not done a very good job of following his lead. And that was in 1967. Now John writes now in his gospel to his church in Ephesus, somewhere around 100 of the common era, that love is the only thing, and it's everything, and it's to everyone like you would your friends. That's the litmus test. And how is it that we love our friends? Do we not give them the benefit of a doubt? Do we not care for them? even when we disagree with them, sometimes vehemently? Do we not forgive them when they trespass against us? Do we not insist and choose to love them regardless? That's the litmus test that Jesus lifts up for his disciples, that you would love one another as I love you, and you are now my friends. Easier said than done. And what's really important about this commandment to love one another is the Greek word he uses. It's agape. You've heard that word before. Agape isn't about feelings. Agape is about a moral regard, a choice to love. 
in a moral and disciplined way regardless of what your feelings are. He doesn't use the word filio, which is brotherly, sisterly love. He doesn't use the word koinonia, which has to do with community love. We're kind of all in this thing together. No, he uses agape, which means I'm going to care for you. I'm going to, with discipline in my mind and my feelings, I'm going to care for your very best outcome regardless of how I feel about you, how I feel about myself. But I'm going to do this because this is the way God loves me unconditionally. First 10 years out of seminary, I was in a covenant group with uh, eight other guys. We were all coming out of seminary about the same time together. And we covenanted with each other with a rule. We got together a couple of times a year. We wrote papers. And we tried to model what the early Methodist bands did. We worshiped. We shared communion. We prayed. We read and studied scripture. We fasted. We held one another up. We held one another accountable for the things that we said we would do as we moved on toward perfection in love, our sanctification. And we did that for 10 years. But I will confess to you that these are eight other guys that if we weren't in a covenant group, they're not the guys I'd be hanging around. Our personalities were just so different. Our interests were so different. We did, I did not hang with any of these guys outside of our covenant times together and our worship together at annual conference. And yet, I loved them. And I know they loved me. We weren't friends as we normally think of being friends, but we were friends in Christ. And we chose to live out this agape with one another regardless. My wife, Reverend Cammie Gaston, just returned yesterday from General Conference in Charlotte, North Carolina. She, in this sanctuary two weeks ago, during the Sunday school hour, offered a primer on what is General Conference, how does it work, and what are going to be our emphases. And she pointed out very succinctly that our delegation from the North Texas Conference and the delegation from the Central Texas Conference over in Fort Worth said that we've got three R's that we're focused on. Regionalization, revision of our social principles, and removal of the restrictive language around homosexuality in our Book of Discipline. It's been there since 1972. I would cast that a little differently and add a fourth R, that all three of those were a referendum on love, on agape love. That when we voted, and by the way, all three of these passed by overwhelming margins, 80% plus at General Conference, delegates from around the world, a seismic shift from four years ago. And you'd say, well, but there have been some disaffiliations, there have been some delegates that would have been there that would have voted no, and you're right. But the numbers who weren't there that would have voted no in no way explain the seismic move of vote swing to say, we choose love. And I believe and can only attribute it to a movement of the Holy Spirit amongst those faithful disciples gathered in some upper rooms in Charlotte. They passed overwhelming regionalization, which is to say that we love our sisters and brothers in every country that Methodism exists enough to say, you know your context better than we do here in the United States. And so together, we entrust you, we love you enough to nuance your book of discipline so that it fits the context of ministry in which you uniquely minister as churches and pastors. We overwhelmingly passed a revision of the social principles, which was a choice to say we love one another enough within our united Methodist church that a hundred different authors from 70 different countries helped write the principles by which all of us will choose to love one another, sometimes in spite of how we feel. 
that collectively this is how we will express global love, wherever we are. And the third R was the removal of the restrictive language regarding homosexuality and whether a person could marry who they love, be ordained, called into ministry, regardless of sexuality. And it too passed by over 80%, where we chose to say, we love you just the way God created you. For you to be able to live into a covenant of marriage, for you to live into a covenant of calling to serve God and to serve the church in the way that God calls you. We love you enough to do that. Next to last day of conference, Cammie got a phone call. It was from Tamburino. Tamburino was her high school softball coach. And she thought, well, this is interesting. Why am I getting a call now? I mean, they don't talk. They're miles apart. So they exchanged pleasantries, but Cammy remained curious to, as to why he was calling her now. And her coach, who was a, a loyal Catholic and a United States veteran, nearly 80 years of age now, of course wanted to share a story, because that's the way Tambo rolls. He tells stories. And he wanted to tell Cammy this story that one of his former players had come up to him after she had graduated from high school a few years later, and she came to him with a whole lot of courage because she wanted to tell him that she was lesbian. And she hoped against hope that the coach she so admired and so loved would not judge her, would not condemn her. She, because she wanted his blessing as her coach, was more fearful of his response than she was of her own father. And, and Tambo simply told her, because he was faithful, because he understood what love is. He said, who you love is none of my business. I call you my friend. We come to the prayer rail today on a historic day after an historic two weeks as United Methodists. Because for the first time, for the first time in my ministry and the first time since the church formed in 1968 here in Dallas, for the first time when Judith and I welcome everyone to this table to say, we love you, regardless of who you are and where you come from, you're welcomed at this table of grace to encounter your friend Jesus. We now mean it officially. Because all you need is love. Thanks be to God. Amen.